Father, one of the benefits of studying the whole of Scripture, which is our privilege here at DTS, is to see that you have worked in time and space. You have worked with your people. You've worked on your people. You uh, raise up kings and put them down. You're in charge of times and seasons. And nothing is ever out of your control. And regardless of how it seems, uh, your ways are always right, even when we don't think they might be. And that's true with whatever you allow into our lives, whether it's disease or disaster or death, as I was informed of dear friends of one of our students whose uh, friend's husband and daughter were killed. Lord, you uh, are still faithful. You're still merciful. You're still you. And we're grateful. Father, in the world in which we live, in the country in which we live, circumstances in which we live, we need to be reminded that uh, even when it seems dark, you are light and there is no darkness in you at all and that we can still walk in light as you are in the light. And we can do that with one another in great fellowship because of the blood of your son that cleanses us from all sin. What a privilege to walk together in light when all around us seems or can be seemingly dark. We have so much to be thankful for and we've come off of a weekend where we've been reminded to be thankful for your bountiful blessing, your work in our lives. Father, meet the needs of our students, our faculty, our staff, our board, our friends. Meet the need of our world, we pray. And Lord, this morning it's a privilege again to hear from our chancellor. And I want to uh, thank you for him. Thank you for his gifts. Thank you for his life his family, his abilities to write and speak with such clarity, rooted in your word, to be applied to our lives, for his uh, church leadership, for his uh, radio ministry, for his print media, for all that you have done with him, through him, as a gift to the body of Christ and to us, his role with us in a continuing relationship and his willingness to come on numerous occasions to open your word to our students and our faculty, we are grateful. Would you use him in our midst again today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I've prayed for him, you're here to hear him. Would you welcome our Chancellor Chuck Swindoll to our class? Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> well, a little belated happy Thanksgiving. I hope it was wonderful. I'm still wearing the meal from the other day. Had such a wonderful time with our, our family, some of our family. And uh, that's over and above any other holiday of the year. That's my, my favorite, clearly my favorite. The thing I love about it is there's just no way to commercialize it. And there's no obligation, you don't have to buy somebody anything. Uh, you don't uh, have to decorate in any way. The only ones who lose are the turkeys. <laughs> and uh, we just gobble them up and uh, enjoy it. I'm, uh, I, I'm probably one of the longest subscribers to Sports Illustrated, that great theological work that comes out once a week. And uh, the other day I was thinking, I've probably been taking that that publication for 40, 45 years. Uh, interesting, for the longest time, because in my opinion, their best writer wrote last in the magazine, I would always read it backwards. I'd start on the last page and then I'd work my way forward. And uh, his name is Rick Riley. 
For some reason, Rick Riley felt the need to retire. When you do an article once a week that covers one page and you have to retire, I don't understand that. It's, it's like when a cartoonist retires. Really? From what? And uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I, really, I, I really miss the articles that are titled The Life of Riley. And uh, if you're a sports fan as I am, you remember many of the things that Riley would write. Sometime a little coarse, earthy, but always, in my opinion, right on. And uh, with such a, a keen and sometimes twisted sense of humor. So I began with... Uh, excerpts from a piece he wrote in 1998 to the graduating class of 98. And because this is a school and because all of you will be graduating, well, most of you will be graduating, <laughs> uh, this might ring a bell and I think you'll see where I'm going before I'm through talking on a subject that's rarely mentioned in a seminary. Thank you, graduates. Please be seated. It's an honor to address the college athletes who are going on to the pros this year. If I may, I'd like to offer just a few pieces of advice to all of you. Every now and again, turn off the iPhone, shut off the television, and open a book. We already have enough jocks who think the brothers Karamazov or the WWF Tag Team Champs. <laughs> if you ever hear yourself saying, they offered me $81 million, what an insult. Find a tire iron, go into a quiet room, and hit yourself very hard on the shins till you wake up. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Marry someone who has never heard of you. Another good piece of advice. Be careful with your money. Write your own checks. None of this power of attorney crap. Get an agent and a, and a lawyer and tell each other that they're both crooks. <laughs> Shock the world. Apologize when you screw up. Never rip up a teammate. Okay, so you didn't grow up with a father. Then go out and be one. Make a difference in the life of one kid who is not your own It'll give you more joy than a lifetime shoe contract. Just remember, you'll die one day. Stop thumping your chest. The line block, the quarterback threw you a perfect spiral while getting his head knocked off, and the good receiver drew double coverage. Get over yourself. <laughs> Once a season, let your offensive guard sh spike the ball. See that woman up there in section 595, road WW, seat 29? She makes 46 k a year. She paid $75 a ticket for her family and, and, and just uh, plunked down 26 bucks for three Cokes and a warm beer. Treat her nice. Without her, you're a 320-pound a bouncer with half a P.E. degree. <laughs> it would help if I could read, wouldn't it? Uh, this is one of my favorites. Go easy on the tattoos. By the time you're 60, that hula girl on your biceps is going to look like Don Knox. I love that, I love that line. <laughs> this is the career you picked. Remember that. If you can't handle public scrutiny or deal with strangers graciously, become a taxidermist. <laughs> Help your opponent up, he'll probably be your teammate next year. No offense, but when you're setting off the airport metal detector from the back of the line, you might be wearing too much jewelry. <laughs> One last thing. Remember when you were a kid, all you dreamed of was playing center field for the New York Yankees? You may soon be there when you are. Don't forget to tingle. I love that last line. 
Someday you are going to be where you dream of being. You will actually be fulfilling the goal of your life in front of a class teaching a room full of students, pastor of a church standing at the pulpit and delivering your message, serving God in some place far removed from home and suddenly having that surge of reality that you are the recipient of his grace now that he has placed you in this unique opportunity to perhaps translate the scriptures into that language or put your arms around the shoulders of those who would never otherwise hear of your Savior. And there you are doing it. Don't forget to tingle. A couple of Sundays ago, I again tingled. Even though I was bringing my 53rd Thanksgiving message, after a while, they do seem to run together a little. But only my wife has heard all of them. She knows how many times I've repeated. So other than she, there would not be that knowledge across the room. And I tingled as I thought, what a privilege to do what I dreamed of doing way back when I sat where you sit. Never having the slightest thought that I would be where I was and where I am. Never. Now, I need to warn you who have those dreams that if you're not careful, the seminary will ruin you. It won't ruin you. You will ruin yourself. Which brings me to the subject that's sort of written between the lines of Rick Rowley's words. And I call it the sinister sin of cynicism. The other day, our pastoral team was discussing uh, the importance of reaching millennials and the value of our doing so since they're there's such a proliferation of that, of that age group now more and more, and certainly in our community that's relatively new, seems to attract many of that age. One of our men said very wisely, the uh, major uh, issue of the millennials is cynicism. And it kind of stuck in my craw when I heard that. Now, you may be a millennial, and that may not be your, your issue. But if that's true, you're an exception. Because your age group has a lot of, of a spirit of entitlement. And if you are not careful, it will only grow during your years here at the school. I warn you. I really warn you of this. I thought before I go any further, it'd be good to define the word since I hadn't done so. Ever looked up the definition of a cynic? Probably you have not. I hadn't. This is what I found. A cynic is a person who looks scornfully who is habitually negative, selfishly or callously calculating. That's a pretty grim series of words, isn't it? It represents a negative or pessimistic, scornful, uh, 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 spirit of scornful uh, toward the, the virtues or the motives of other people. You look scornfully at that. And this one got to me, marked by or showing contemptuous mockery. 
Uh, how does that have anything to do with being a seminary student? Well, stick around long enough and, and you'll find why I mention it. Because the longer you're here, the greater the temptation to move in that direction. Some of you have already become pessimistic and cynical. And I would say this is especially true among you who are highly intelligent linguistically gifted. You grab those theological concepts and, and, and you get it. You can mouth them with hardly a second thought. You memorize easily the, uh, the verb stems don't throw you a curve. And before you know it, you find yourself reading from the original text some of you almost as easily as you do from the English. I get nervous about people like you. <laughs> Not out of envy, but out of fear. Because as years pass, you will become increasingly more arrogant. And if you don't watch it, you will be truly cynical, even though engaged in what others see as ministry. I say it that way because it may not be for you ministry at all. So I'm here today, if you'll allow me to fill a role, think of me not as your father, but as your grandfather. Been down the road a while, and uh, at 82, I, I know most of the mistakes that can be made because I've made most of them. And by the way, I'm still making some. So you never get past that. But by making those mistakes, you learn. And by looking back enough years, you realize some of those things really started when I was at the school. And if I don't watch it, they will uh, proliferate. And success doesn't help. Adulation doesn't help. Applause doesn't help. All of that will drive you deeper into your hypocrisy. As you look like you're really one way, but you're faking it because down deep inside, you're another. All of this drives me again to the text I've been using through the semester, 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul writes to his younger colleague in ministry, Timothy. Paul is on his last leg or close to it. Timothy is really uh, midway, probably in his 40s engaged in ministry, most likely in Ephesus, booming city. In those days, could be even seen as a metropolis. So Paul puts himself with those years of experience into Timothy's sandals and imagines life for this younger man, just as I'm doing today as I look at all of you. And Paul writes to Timothy, Verse 7 of chapter 4, last part. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Gumnazo is the word. We get a word gymnas gymnastics or gymnasium from it, translated here. Discipline yourself. Stay fit. Exercise. Stay alert. Uh, day before yesterday, I had my physical with Dr. Ken Cooper. That's an experience. And uh, I've been going to him for 33 years, so he really knows, knows me very well. Very well. And um, <laughs> they have now added a, a, a part to their examination which is once you pass 75, they give you a written and oral uh, test on, on your uh, memory as they are checking for 
the preliminary signs of Alzheimer's, which is the growing disease of our day. Know many friends and many friends who have family members, uh, even in their 50s and 60s now, beginning to show signs of dementia. So Dr. Cooper's concern is that his patients, if they are showing such signs, he can help them. He can help us with that. Um, and I'm thinking about this whole idea of staying fit and disciplining yourself, including your mind. And so the test comes. They give you a number of words to remember, but they don't ask you to repeat them right away. They spend the next 10, 15 minutes on other th subjects. Then they come back to it and, say, and they'll say, now give us the words that we just gave you. Uh, another one is to count backwards by seven, starting at 100 down to two. How you doing with that one? <laughs> so I've learned that test and I've memorized that. So I'll whip those babies out one after another. And they know right away, so they change it to nine or five or whatever. And then there are those... Uh, memory tests they give you of, of other kinds. Name as many words as you can that start with this letter in the next 60 seconds. And you know, something happens when they put a stopwatch on you, you go, um, 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 um. <laughs> and uh, thankfully I, I was able to get 30 out of 30 and he was very pleased with that. I think it softens Dr. Cooper when he uh, examines me because I take a stack of my latest books and I give them to him. It's kind of like an apple for the teacher ahead of time, you know. Well, as a result, he and I have built up a real friendship. In fact, I'm going to spend a little time with him when this meeting is over. And uh, he's the sharpest 85-year-old man I've ever known. Could probably still wear his Air Force uniform. Still runs every day. Still does his exercises every day. He originated the word aerobics. When he first started, he tried to get a loan for a, a simple million dollars to help get started on the corner of Willow and Preston. And one bank told him, no, I don't think we're interested in a cult like that. And they didn't even know what aerobics was. Uh, by the way, that bank really wishes they'd have made that loan to Dr. Cooper right about now. Discipline yourself. Stay alert. Stay aware. Be a good student of yourself. Do a little self-analysis today and during the holidays that will come. Look at yourself. Is that biblical? Look at verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. I love the way the New Living renders it. Keep a close watch on how you live, on your teaching. Stay true to what is right. That's my counsel to all of us today. Watch out for cynicism. It'll eat your lunch at this school. You'll begin to discount the value of certain teachers. You'll begin to see yourself as more important than you are. Because you've learned a little, you'll realize, I'm ahead of most of the ones in my class. You start believing your own stuff. Trouble starts at that point, and before you know it, you get cynical about things that really ought to be kept sacred. You no longer tingle. Remember when you got the letter that said you're accepted? You tingled. Why don't you still tingle? Why don't you still look forward to that new course and the opportunity to discover realms of truth you would not otherwise know, realizing that will equip you for ministry among those people who are starving. Not only for knowledge, but for how to live their lives. Notice how it's written? Pay close attention to yourself and then to your teaching. 
You see, Dallas Seminary is strong on words. We're, we're, we're a very verbal school. And uh, we like tests, you noticed? And uh, they come up rather frequently. And we grade words and the ability to repeat what we were told. All of that academic. And I realize that you, you, you can't great people on emotions. You have to go somewhere to find a standard, so we great people on the ability to think through uh, whatever may be the course and then complete the test and ideally do well on it. Before you know it, uh, because of the frequent overuse and familiarity, over the years, the Bible becomes just another textbook. You've done this passage before. You did this section. You did that series in the former church. You're very familiar with the Gospels, the story of Jesus, and on and on through the letters and even things future. You... Uh, you, you can complete the test. All of this brings me to another reading I want to do for you, so sit back and listen. Paul David Tripp, in his book, Dangerous Calling. It was a moment of greater insight than I realized at the time. I look back and see it as a sweet moment of divine rescue just the kind of grace that was to be the passion of the ministry to which I had been called. I was exegeting my way through Romans, Paul's foundational gospel exposition. I had taken a bound legal-sized notebook and cut a square out of the top right-hand corner of every third page so I could glue a page of the Greek text on both sides of the page. I would then fill the pages with corresponding exegetical notes, sermon outlines, and illustrations. It was an, ex an exercise that brought all of my recently taught and newly acquired ministry skills together. I found the exercise challenging and exciting. I felt proud that my notebook was filled with my notes on Romans. I was engulfed in an intoxicating world of language syntax and theological argument. I labored over tenses, context, objects, and connectors. I studied etymologies and the Pauline vocabulary. I tried to connect every minute detail to the overarching intention of the writer. I consulted all of the experts weighing insight over insight, opinion against opinion. Countless hours of disciplined private study were represented by page upon page of legal-sized page notes. It was all very rewarding. One evening, hours into exegeting the next section of Romans, it hit me. I'd spent hours each day for months studying perhaps the most extensive and gorgeous exposition of the gospel that's ever been written. And I had been fundamentally untouched by its message. The message had little impact on me. It had been all grammar and syntax, theological ideas and logical arguments. It had been a, a, a massive intellectual exercise, but almost completely devoid of spiritual power. I can remember staring, staring at my ink-filled pages. They seemed distant and blurry. Somehow, somehow not attached to real life, not having anything to do with me personally. No, I wasn't delusional. Uh, I had written all of it, but it all seemed detached from me. My real life, my marriage, my struggles with sin, my past, my future, my deepest hopes and dreams, 
and fears, I stared at the page and it seemed impossible that I could have done all of this work when it had been little more than an assignment for a class for a grade in pursuit of a degree. Listen to me today. Paul David Tripp is describing you unless you're very different from most. I sat there numb for a moment as if I had been suspended between two worlds, one real and one that seemed anything but real. I thought of all the classes, all the papers, all the tests. I thought of the, of the huge investment of time, energy, and money. Was it all for this? I began to cry. No, I mean really cry. Powerful emotions came out of me so much so that Luella heard me from another room and came in to see if I was okay. I was anything but okay. And she knew it at first glance. Luella bent down, put her arms around me, asked me to tell her what was wrong. I remember she looked frightened. As she watched her young seminary husband falling apart before her eyes in my typically dramatic fashion, I told her I was done. That I could not continue my seminary studies. I told her it was over. Fortunately, I'm married to a wise and patient woman who helped me get my bearings and stood with me as I continued and then, and then finished my studies. That evening, with my exegetical notebook in my hands, I learned something about myself and about the scriptures. My eyes began to open to the dangers inherent in academizing our faith. I personally experienced what can happen when the gospel of Jesus Christ gets reduced to a series of theological ideas coupled with all the skills necessary to access those ideas. Bad things happen when maturity is more defined by knowing than it is by being. Don't miss that. You're tested on knowing. Unfortunately, there aren't many tests on being. It's easy in a physical exam to check one's physical strength. But how do you do an examination on one's motives? Or virtues like kindness and thoughtfulness and forgiveness and mercy and compassion. No test for that. That's a self-test. And unfortunately, you're too busy doing academic tests to take time to pay attention to yourself and doing what is right. Danger is afloat when you come to love ideas more than the God whom they represent and the people they are meant to free. Bear with me through a story he tells that I think illustrates what he's getting at, and you'll hear the cynicism. One of the courses I was asked to teach as a member of the practical theology faculty of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia was in pastoral counseling. I decided that I would come in each semester armed with a catalog of pastoral horror stories. You know, the kinds of things no pastor really wants to deal with, but which all pastors do. I told my students stories of the late night calls from wives who have just been slugged by their husbands. Of the grief of the mother who has discovered her 15-year-old daughter is pregnant of standing with a mom and dad before the casket of their four-year-old son, of the hours with a severely depressed person or with a man who has spent his family into financial disaster. 
I told him stories of the grief and travail of the body of Christ as it has lived with the realities of life in a sin-broken world. Stories of fear, disloyalty, discouragement, anger, depression, aloneness, and loss. I wanted my students to understand that they're called not just to preach exegetically, correct, and theologically precise sermons, but also to pastor people, to walk, live, support, and suffer with them. I wanted them to know that they're called to be more than local church theological instructors. I wanted them to feel the weight of being called to make an invincible Christ visible and meaningful. I began each semester by dipping into stories of my own pastoral unreadiness and failures with hopes that my narrative would be used to birth in them a greater, more roundly visible vision of pastoral ministry. It was in the middle of one of those stories when something happened I will never forget, nor will any of the students who were in that class. I was recounting my own heart struggles when I, had, uh, when I had been asked yet again to visit a man who had already eaten up much of my pastoral time and energy, when one of my students suddenly raised his hand and blurted out, all right, all right, Professor Tripp, uh, we, we know that we'll have to uh, deal with projects like this in our churches. Tell us what to do with them so we can get back to the work of ministry. There are many things to pay attention to in that statement, but notice he didn't even call struggling people, people. To him, they were projects, obstructions in the way of his definition of ministry. I walked down the aisle to his desk I knelt down so we were face to face and I asked him to repeat what he had said loudly and word for word. I was pastoring him at the moment and the class who had heard what he had said, I wanted them never to forget the moment. I asked him to repeat what he had called the people. He softly said, um, projects. It was a wonderful God-given teaching moment not too long ago. I was greeted by a pastor who had been in that class years before. He had remembered it and had been warned again and again by his memory. Years ago, I was at another church and we took a trip with our interns. Happened to have about seven or eight pastoral interns serving with us for a year and we always would go in a van, all of us riding together, several of us pastors, and then all of the interns. And we would visit from one church to another, to another. Uh, always churches that were different from our own, so we would see a broader picture of the pastoral scene. And possibly the kind of church in which one or more of them may serve. Uh, we, we stopped at... Uh, one church that was growing and active and rather popular in that particular part of the state. And the pastor was busy at the moment, but would see us in a few moments. So we thought we would just visit with the custodian. You often find out a lot about the, the, the church by talking to the one who cleans up the mess after all the sheep have left. And he was busy taking out old worship folders and picking up communion cups. And so I said to him, uh, well, you really, you, you really have a, a, a wonderful facility here. This is great. I said, uh, busy on Sunday morning. He said, uh, yeah, he said, we, uh, we uh, process about 2,500 units every Sunday. I didn't think anything of it. It just kind of came out. To him and maybe to the staff, 
people had become units who were being processed. Cynicism. Maybe you wouldn't have seen it as that, but down underneath there is this overexposure. Samey same. Year after year. Season after season, holiday after holiday, need after need, and before long, you're dealing with projects and units. And when you start dealing with that, something serious has happened to you. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Stay true to what is right. I, I, have, uh, I have no way of knowing, nor do you, what the next 10, 20, 30 years will bring for you. You'll be out of the school. All of these classroom experiences will be but a memory. The profs will be faces in your mind. You'll remember a few statements from some of them. Courses will have been taken and notes from those courses long since forgotten or perhaps filed away. And you'll be engaged in doing the work of ministry. It's amazing what happens when uh, people look at what's being done as opposed to working where it's done. I, I thought of that recently, getting grandkids together to go to Disney World. It's all exciting, and everybody looks forward to it. We're going to be there a couple of days, and we'll do all the rides we can possibly do, and what a difference between that and working at Disney World. Look into the faces who are there every day. How about taking a, a flight to some exotic place, and the joy of being with the love of your life for several days, and you're able to get away, how different from working for American Airlines or United. How about a football game where we go and we're there for a couple, three hours and yelling our lungs out and how different for those who work in the concession stands and sell peanuts to the customers, to the fans. That's the side you and I are on. We're the ones engaged in the work of ministry. We're doing the planning, thinking through where we're going, what we want to see accomplished. And I, I, I urge you to guard against the sinister sin, how easy it can settle in. And it starts right here. How valuable it would be for you to do, when you do have a break coming up, some soul searching of your own walk. Stay with your courses. Dig in, give it your best. But remember, these are academic courses, unless they're rare where the prof takes time to do some shepherding. And when he does, or when she does, listen. Unlike the student who didn't have much room for that with Dr. David, Paul David Tripp. My life was changed when I was in the United States Marine Corps. It took being 8,000 miles away from my wife 
on a distant island where I did not know a soul, nor did a soul know me. I was there for 16 months. And I thank God upon every remembrance of a representative with the navigators who for some reason by the grace of God took an interest in this young Marine. Or I would have been just like all the others in my barracks in the village messing around with the prostitutes that are made available to quote, service the military. But because of Bob Newkirk, a man you don't know and will never meet, because of his love for me and time spent with me, opened his home to me every time I was on liberty. Feel free to come and stay with us. The thing I loved about Bob, a couple of things really, uh, he has a great sense of humor. And he also had a real sensitive spirit. Only a time or two did I detect some cynicism. In fact, one evening, rainy monsoon season, I went to his home in Naha. Knocked on his door, and Norma came to the door and said that Bob was down at his little office down in the village. He said, I don't, know, I don't know if you know this, Chuck, but he's been going through a really difficult time. Had a lot of criticism. And uh, had begun to drift a little. The details of which I don't need to know, but I understand, having done that myself. My heart kind of went out to him and I didn't go in. I said, do you think he'd mind if I dropped by? She said, I, I really don't know because he left really at the bottom. And uh, I said, I think I'll go to the village. So I went back, caught a little jitney down to the main town of the island and wormed my way through the back alleys to a little bamboo, almost shack that was his office. You could literally see through the bamboo. Before I got there, as the rain was falling and dripping off my nose, I could hear him. And I looked in, he never knew that I'd been there. And I saw a man on his knees Two candles were burning to the side. His Bible had been opened, and he was with his God. And he was singing, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I learned more about prayer that night on the island in the monsoon, listening to my mentor, than I learned about prayer in four years at seminary. I will never forget watching a man struggling through a low point in his life on his knees. You know, I can often tell people who have never been mentored, my heart goes out to you. Because there's something about having a life rubbed off onto yours that doesn't hide from you the battles, the dark side. Chances are good you do not know one of the struggles any of these faculty members has. Because seminary isn't mentoring. It's an academic institution that teaches people theology, the languages, 
Christian education, church history, and the subjects of the faith. But what equips you for ministry is you're paying close attention to yourself and persevering in that. I want us for the next few moments just to bow our heads. Will you do that? Just, just sit there and close your eyes. Has the routine and repetition begun to sort of dull the edge? Gotten a little jaded? Even go so far as to say cynical you got to take care of that you got to address that you got to dig down deep and root that out or it'll follow you and it'll crop up again if you're not careful it'll mess up your parenting and your marriage and on top of all of that, it'll darken your ministry. May God deliver us from learning how to act. That is, being actors in ministry and becoming really brokenhearted, saved by grace sinners who minister out of our brokenness and need. Don't let this new year begin in the same way you've ended this one. Deal with it. Uh, dear Father, we uh, acknowledge uh, that everything within us wants to push away at these things. And, and, and we want to deny that it has gotten as serious as it is. We get so good at faking it, making great grades and failing in the private areas of our walk with you. Help us all, our Father, to keep tingling, to stay excited about the things that you love to which we are called. May we never lose the joy of serving Jesus ministering to people, being real, deeply touching lives. Finally, Lord, uh, enable us to glean from this school the best it has, knowing that there are many things it cannot teach us. So we pray as you pick up the slack that will be teachable, as willing as my friend Bob to acknowledge that we're prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said. <clears throat>